BP Liberal Prime Minister is not worth the corruption or the cover-up. These Liberals fought tooth and nail to prevent Canadians from getting the documents that told the truth about their massive security breach at Canada's top-level laboratory, and we now know why they were so eager to cover them up. The documents reveal that this Liberal government allowed two scientists who were a very serious and credible danger and a realistic and credible threat to Canada's economic security to compromise the Winnipeg lab. CSIS reported that one of the scientists intentionally transferred scientific knowledge and materials to China to benefit the PRC. The Prime Minister has said he admires China's basic dictatorship, so it's no surprise that under his watch, the regime in Beijing was allowed to infiltrate what was supposed to be one of Canada's most secure facilities. Only a common-sense Conservative government will stand on guard for our country and make sure this never happens again. The Honourable Member from Markham Unionville. Mr. Speaker, as a Member of Parliament for Markham Unionville, I rise today with great pride on this final day of Black History Month. Throughout this month, I have had the immense pleasure of attending numerous events, both here in Ottawa and in my community of Markham. As we reflect on the struggles and crimes of black Canadians, we are reminded of their immense contribution to every aspect of our society. From arts and culture to business and politics, black Canadians have shaped our nation in profound ways. To all my constituents in Markham Unionville and to the organization like YRAC and MACA, thank you for your work in the month of February and I, my heartfelt wishes for a very happy conclusion to Black History Month. I hope this month has been a time of learning, celebration, and above all, a reminder of our shared commitment to diversity and inclusion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And happy Black History Month. Oral questions, questions oral. The Honourable Member from Wellington, Halton Hill. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, not only did the government neglect national security, not only did they cover up things. They continue to skirt responsibility. Yesterday, the Minister of Health said no high officials involved in the um, micropology lab will be held responsible. If there's no one responsible, who within the Cabinet will know who is responsible? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. At the beginning, it's important to say that health agencies are independent, particularly in terms of national security. And it's our government that created a process to make sure that all the information is available. And it's really important for two Canadian citizens who were very well known as scientists did bad things like this, and there is an investigation underway with the RCMP, and this is very important, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Wellington, Halton Hill. Mr. Speaker, the Canada-China Committee in 2019 could have done exactly the same job as the Ad Hoc Committee did, and we could have had the documents three years ago. The CSIS assessments released yesterday make it clear the PRC is and was actively recruiting top Canadian scientists to plunder Canada's research and intellectual property. The assessments also make clear that the PRC wants to weaponize the civilian research for military purposes against us and our allies. Knowing what we know now, now, will the government halt all collaboration between the Winnipeg National Microbiology Laboratory and any entities and individuals in the People's Republic of China? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Health. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I want to say that an attack on our national security by foreign nations, be it China or Russia, represents an attack on democracy and represents a direct attack on every member of this House. And that I share his outrage that China or any country would attempt to interfere in our process. The Public Health Agency, which is one of the most respected agencies in the world, hired two Canadian citizens who are eminent, eminent uh, uh, and well-known scientists in Canada who lied. It is the Public Health Agency that discovered that. It is the Public Health Agency that fired them. And that's why there's now an RCMP investigation about their actions. The Honourable Member from Wellington, Halton Hills. The documents, Mr. Speaker, reveal a shocking disregard for Canada's national security. They re reveal a government 
that is completely asleep at the switch on national security and the machinery of government. They reveal government employees collaborating with Beijing's government and with the biological weapons unit of the People's Liberation Army. Oh. Equally shocking are the health minister's comments. He said yesterday, there, is, there was no evidence of actual breaches at the lab and no sensitive information actually left the country. The documents say otherwise. Does the minister stand by those comments? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, the two Canadian scientists in question were well known for their work in virology uh, and had spent uh, their time working on uh, uh, health treatments for those that were suffering from viruses. Uh, they are collaboration. There is absolutely no evidence of the thing that the member opposite is suggesting. And I do not think that it is, it is at all appropriate to suggest that they were involved with weaponization or things of this nature. When we're, they have all the documents, they can see all the information. They've been, we have waived all the normal considerations not only of national security, Mr. Speaker, but of uh, employee relationships that normally are kept confidential. It was our government that did that. That's why they have this information. The Honourable Member from Cumberland, Colchester. Speaker, a scientist working with Ebola at Canada's only Level 4 lab collaborated with the People's Republic of China Army Major General. Sadly, this story does not end there. Dr. Chu was able to gain access to the lab for students from China, and it gets worse, a scientist from the Academy of Military Medical Sciences, the research arm of the PLA, known to work on biology-enabled warfare. How did so many citizens from a hostile superpower gain access to Canada's top lab? Is it because the Prime Minister admires China's basic dictatorship? The Honourable Minister of Health. Attempt to national security concerns to play partisan games. I think that's unfortunate. And let me just give an example. With respect to Ebola, the exchange of Ebola in 2019 was done in the context of trying to work with China and other countries on finding solutions to Ebola, which exists in so many different parts of the country. At that moment in time in 2019, the relationship with China was in a different place. The information that was shared was through legitimate channels. It has nothing to do with this issue. It was absolutely known and handled with complete control. I think it's very very important to not mischaracterize national security for partisan interests. I'd like to remind all members to ensure that they don't use language which would be unparliamentary directed at any of their colleagues. The Honourable Member from Cumberland Colchester. Speaker, that Minister's comments are reckless and untrue. Before March 31st, 2019, the PRC did not have a containment level 4 lab. How can I be so specific about the date? This is the date on which a scientist at Canada's top lab, the National Microbiology Lab, shipped dangerous pathogens, including Ebola virus, to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. This scientist had a history of visiting and collaborating with the PLA since 2016. When did the Minister of Health and the Prime Minister know about the espionage and blatant violation of our sovereignty? And when did they decide to cover it up? Here. The Honourable Minister of Health. The exact opposite of the cover-up occurred is actually this government that created the process that released these documents. So they, ref they actually refused to participate in this process. The second thing that I will say, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, with respect to our national security interests, that it is essential when we're dealing with national security to recognize two things. That the party opposite is saying that they would support a partisan interference in the Public Health Agency of Canada, that if they were in government they would see it as acceptable for political interference into that process. No. It's out of an arm's length, and rightfully it is at an arm's length. They are the ones that identified these Canadian citizens, these eminent scientists, were lying, and they took action. There he is. Order. Colleagues. The Honourable Member. The Honourable Member for St. Jean. The Court of Appeal has just handed down its ruling on the State Secularism Law, Bill 21, which is, has a broad consensus in Quebec. Quebecers want a clear separation of religion and state, and that's what this law guarantees. Now that the Appeals Court has handed down its ruling, it's clear that the next step is the Supreme Court. We saw it with Bill 101, and we'll see it again with Bill 21. What we're asking Ottawa is simple. Can you, please, stay out of it, either directly or or indirectly, because Quebec knows what's good for Quebec. Thank you.
The Honorable Minister of Justice. I appreciate the question, and obviously the court has just rendered its decision. I will read it, and we will reflect on it. But I'd like to say the message again that we've always given. We will always be here to defend the Charter of Human Rights, and if this ruling does get to the uh, Supreme Court, we'll be there to intervene. Deputy. The Honorable Member for Saint-Jean. I repeat, Quebec knows what is good for Quebec. We know that French is not only our official language, but also our common language, and that it must be protected. We know that equality between men and women is non-negotiable. In Quebec, just like we know, the best way to protect religion is to have versus a state to have none. And that's what Bill 21 is about. And that, too, is a broad consensus in Quebec. So will the Liberals, who say they don't like bickering, commit to not going against the will of Quebecers on Bill 21? Have the Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I've always... Uh, all. Our government has always underscored that we'll always be here to defend the Canadian Charter. This includes freedom of expression and freedom of religion and equality. Nevertheless, if this ruling does make it to the Supreme Court of Canada, we'll be there to intervene. The Honourable Member from Burnaby South. The Arrive Canada drama never stops. Remember we told the Liberals that they could ask public service to do the work that was required. They said, no, it's not possible. Well, it turns out that the Arrive Can contract was awarded to a D&D employee. Oh. A public servant actually did the work. Under the Liberals, public money going to private consultants tripled. Why are the Liberals trying to give the Conservatives a run for their money and how much money they can waste on private consulting? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister for National Defence. I actually want to thank the member for the, for the question because I think it's an important one. Mr. Speaker, at, as soon as we were made aware that the CEO of Dalian was a D&D employee, we've taken immediate action to suspend all contracts with Dalian, and I can confirm for this House that all active contracts with Dalian have been suspended. We've also, I can also confirm to this House that the member in question has also been suspended. The matter will be thoroughly investigated. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, once again, I'm going to ask uh, colleagues to please uh, be respectful of the questions that are asked and, of course, of the answer given for many reasons. One of them, of course, is, is that members who require the use of translation can't hear uh, through the, their uh, earphones if uh, members are shouting in terms of the response. Then I have the, the Honourable Member for Burnaby South. A six-person family and a pregnant woman live under a highway in Montreal. They were kicked out of their apartment. They cannot find affordable housing. This is the result of the Liberals and the Conservatives who have lost more than a million units of affordable housing. Will the Liberals, or are they ashamed of their track record, or are they too disconnected from reality? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur. Mr. Speaker. We know that every person in Canada has a right to a home. It is a fundamental right. We doubled funding for communities to fight against homelessness and to make sure everyone has a roof over their heads. Mr. Speaker, we know there's a lot of work to be done, but unlike the Conservatives, it's not through bickering with municipalities that will get there. We need to sit down with everyone and find a lasting solution to homelessness in Canada. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Selkirk Interlec Eastman. This Prime Minister isn't worth the cost, the crime, the corruption or the cover-ups. After hiding the Winnipeg lab documents from Canadians for over three years, we finally know why the Liberals blocked Parliament. We know that Dr. Chu had close and clandestine relationships with entities of the People's Republic of China and collaborated with military scientists. The People's Liberation Army is a known security threat to Canada. Yeah, right. So why did the Prime Minister cover up this breach of national security instead of arresting these spies. Good question. The Honourable Minister of Health. 
the first part of the question is I suspect they're going to have other questions on the second element. On the first order, it was uh, the first offer was to have all parliamentarians uh, look at the documents through NSI COP. That was an immediate offer. Some opposition members said that that wasn't a full, that wasn't a good answer because they wanted to make sure that if there was a need for redactions to be released, they wanted a process. So I, as House Leader at that point in time, suggested an ad hoc process that would ensure that an independent arbiter would make the decision about releasing those documents. I would remind the member again that it is an independent decision of the public health agency to make redactions. I'm sure he's not suggesting that anything else other than that should happen. The Honourable Member from Selkirk Interlake that Eastman. That House Leader actually sued the Speaker. Mr. Dr. Chu maliciously shared technology and materials from the Winnipeg Lags with Ma Major General Chen, one of Beijing's top commanders at the Academy of Military Medical Science. The Academy is described in the CSIS documents as the highest medical research institution of the People's Liberation Army of the PRC and has offensive biological weapons capabilities. And one of its objectives is to transform the results of basic civilian research into military applications and biotechnologies. The Chinese built military can now make more biological weapons and potentially use them against Canadians wow. and our allies. Wow. Why did the Prime Minister cover up this national security threat? The Honourable Minister of Health. I've already said that the documents uh, first were released and then, and then the additional redactions were actually commenced by us. The second point is uh, when the member says maliciously, uh, we don't know what their intention was. That's the purpose of an RCMP investigation. Secondly, these, were, these are individuals uh, that, that I am deeply concerned about, like the member opposite. And in a process of due process, we understand what they did. With respect to the Chinese government, the military and the government and academia and scientists are all part of their military. That means that any connection that they had whatsoever uh, would have touched that. And so I think it's careful. Colleagues, it's hard to hear for the chair to hear the response. If uh, members are not satisfied with the response, uh, sometimes the best opportunity is just to listen to it in silence and let it stand on its own. The Honourable Member from uh, uh, Selkirk Interlake Eastman. The Health Minister should actually read the CSIS documents that actually describes all the breaches that were done and the espionage that was carried out. At the Prime Minister's top public health lab in Canada, Beijing military scientist Dr. Yan was given unfettered access to all the labs and the computer systems at the Winnipeg labs, which were covertly shared by Dr. Chu with Beijing. Instead of stopping this espionage, the Prime Minister decided to cover it up. Why did the Prime Minister put his admiration for the basic dictatorship of the Communist Party in Beijing ahead of the public safety of Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important to step back and really consider what the Conservative uh, Party is saying here. Uh, that the, at, the end, at the time in which they were hired, the, these two Canadian citizens were eminent scientists uh, who were well published and well regarded throughout North America. Uh, the fact that they lied and misrepresented themselves, Mr. Speaker, is reprehensible. Colleagues, I'm going to ask members, please. I'll ask the member from uh, Miramichi Grand Lakes, please. Uh, to keep his comments to himself until the, when he, he will have the floor at the time that he asks a question. The Honourable Minister of Health has 15 seconds left on the clock. So I would hope what they're not suggesting is that if they were in power, that they would have uh, interfered politically, told, been able through clairvoyance to know that these eminent scientists who at this point in time had no reason to believe that they were anything other than Canadian scientists who were doing good research, that they would have interfered politically with clairvoyance and got rid of them before this happened. Member from Mr. Speaker, yesterday we learned that there were documents with respect to the Winnipeg lab, and the worst is con confirmed there was a leak from the Chinese Communist Party. And the first represent person uh, represents a serious and credible threat uh, to Canada's economy, was able to access this level four laboratory. Why did he not? Uh, protect Canadians, the Prime Minister, the Honourable Minister of Health. China, Russia, or any other country, well, it, well, this is an attack against our democracy, the House of Commons, and every member here, and it concerns me greatly. And this is the reason why 
we have measures now to ensure that we protect our public safety with policies that are as strong as possible to make sure our objective of in, uh, is not compromised. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg or Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, the Minister said that the Prime Minister, ad well, the Prime Minister said he admired the basic dictatorship of China. And this lab in Winnipeg was working on some of the most dangerous viruses in the world. And there were dangerous pathos pathogens that were passed on to the Chinese party. Does he realize that the our national safety was in peril? Mr. The Honourable Minister, what Canadians realize today, well, when we're talking about national security, it's not a partisan issue. And if there's something we won't take lessons on for the Conservative Party is protecting national security on research and science in Canada. We are the government that did the most to protect science in this country, to protect IP, to help our universities and research centres to identify risks. Mr. Speaker, last January we published a list that indicates our research institutes, research institutes rather, that not do uh, business. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg saint charles Mr. Speaker, does the minister on, know that on March 31st, the Ebola virus was sent to uh, Beijing through Canada? Uh, we sent a weapon to a country that is building up its stock of biological weapons. Does the prime minister realize that his government failed because the Chinese government is developing biological weapons and he's putting our security at risk, the Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, rather than talking about facts, what we hear from the opposition today is politicizing national security. And I think that all colleagues that were elected to this chamber, their first responsibility is the security and health of Canadians. As I said last January, we did publish a list for I, entities uh, that are protected to protect national security and IP will always be here to defend national security in Canada. Have the Honourable member, member for Drummond, the Court of Appeal is clear. Bill 21 is constitutional and does not pose a problem. The fact that we've recognized the right of Quebecers to, to recreate their own rules means we've turned the page. But there are a few people who continue to contest it. What will the Liberal government choose to do? Respect the will of Quebecers with this appeals court decision or continue bickering with Quebec? The Honourable Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to underscore that our government is clearly committed to defending the rights of liberties protected under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, particularly in terms of the right of freedom of expression and the right to equality. Our government has clearly expressed concerns with respect to the preventive use of the notwithstanding clause. If it does, uh, this decision, guess, does get to the Supreme Court, we'll be there to intervene. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Uh, yes, we're talking about respect for charter and court decisions as well, because despite what the Liberals say, Bill 21 has nothing to be criticized for. It is legitimate. It is a pillar, pillar for living together in harmony, which Quebecers want. And Liberals' fears are unfounded. Now that the appeals court has rendered its ruling, will the government commit to not contesting this Bill 21, either directly or indirectly? The Honourable Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, Mr. Speaker, like the Prime Minister has already said, as I have already said, our government is committed to defending the rights and liber liberties of Canadians protected under the Charter. Nevertheless, uh, we, well, we have to protect freedom of religion and expression. We've also said that our government has clearly expressed concerns with respect to the prevented use of the notwithstanding clause. If this case does go before the Supreme Court, our government will intervene. Have the Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. It's worrisome. The Liberal Liberals want 
secularism without any trace. They don't want us to say anything. They want to make it in significant, but separating religion and state does mean something. It means that we respect the beliefs and the non-beliefs of each other, and they never get involved in the relationship with the state. Bill 21 has true implications, and the appeals court has recognized this, and the use of the notwithstanding clause is not only constitutional, but legitimate for Bill 21. The Honourable Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, Mr. Speaker, as mentioned by the Prime Minister and myself, we are clearly committed to defend, defend the right, rights and freedoms in the Canadian Charter, notably the right to freedom of religion, expression, and right to equality. On several occasions, you've also said that we have serious concerns with the prevented use of the notwithstanding clause. If this case does get heard by the Supreme Court, our government will be here. You are. The Honourable Member from St. Albert, Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, this NDP Liberal Prime Minister isn't worth the cost or the cover-up. For three years, this Prime Minister covered up a terrifying national security breach at Canada's highest security lab, hiding the fact that the head of special pathogens was actively collaborating with top Beijing military scientists engaged in biodefense and bioterrorism. So, in the face of that, will the Prime Minister accept responsibility for this colossal failure on his watch? Here, here, here. Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Health. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I've answered that question on numerous occasions, but let me uh, address the preposition at the start of that question, where he says the, uh, the, the working together with another political party, uh, he doesn't want to do that, and I get that. He's used to making partisan points and not reaching across the aisle and collaborating. But you know what happens when you collaborate, Mr. Speaker, when you work together? You get national pharmacare. You get the ability to say to those that have diabetes that you've got your back and you've got medication. You say to women, we're going to give you real freedom, freedom over your sexuality freedom over re or reproductive rights. That's what happens when, when you stop focusing on partisan politics and you start focusing on results. Yeah. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, oh, sorry, St. Albert, Edmonton. What a disgraceful answer from this minister. A national security culture begins at the top with the Prime Minister. This is a Prime Minister who said that he admires Beijing's basic dictatorship. This is a Prime Minister who, over the past eight years, has repeatedly ignored Beijing's interference. So, in the face of that, is it any wonder that under this Prime Minister's watch, top Beijing military scientists had unfettered access to some of Canada's most sensitive biological secrets? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, in the first order, that isn't true. Uh, what is true is that the Public Health Agency of Canada, which is one of the most respected agencies in the world, that was there for us throughout the pandemic, uh, is entirely responsible for its operations. And the truth is that they, there were two individuals hired. They were Canadian citizens, eminent scientists, well-known and well-respected across, uh, across Canada and indeed uh, around the world, who lied to the Public Health Agency of Canada. The Public Health Agency of Canada then took the very responsible action of firing those individuals, turning the matter over to the RCMP, where they currently are under investigation, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, where are they? Where are they? The Honourable Member from St. Albert, Edmonton, had the opportunity to ask two questions. If I'm certain he could speak to his House leader to ask more questions in the House. But until that time, please, I'd ask him to uh, wait his turn until he has the microphone, until he has the floor. The Honourable Member from uh, Lennox and uh, Addington. Speaker, Fonda. evidence speaks otherwise. After eight years, this Liberal NDP Prime Minister is not worth the cost nor the cover-up. He can't be trusted to keep our people safe. Right. Yesterday, the entire nation was shocked to learn that this government granted two People's Liberation Army assets full access to secret research in a top-secret Canadian lab. Right. This represents the biggest security breach since the Cold War. Right. And this happened under a Prime Minister who famously said his he admires China's basic dictatorship. Mr. Speaker, how can Canadians trust a Prime Minister that fails to take national security seriously? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, uh, the representations made by the member uh, are, are, 
are inaccurate, and I would invite people to read the documents, which have been fully redacted. But this is the, this is the contrast, Mr. Speaker, between a party that is focused on partisanship and difference. Uh, when, and you know what? You talk, the, the member opposite talks about uh, working with another party and what that might accomplish. What about dental care, Mr. Speaker? When we focused on cooperation, we were able to get dental care done for this country. We were able to make sure that nine million Canadians, three million seniors, will have access to dental care. They're voting against that. They're against that. Are they against pharmacare? Are they against the other fruits of cooperation that come from? Sorry, uh, colleagues, rather. Colleagues. Again, colleagues, it is very important for us, for those of us uh, who have the ability to speak both languages, it's a clear advantage of being in the House that we don't require the use of the he uh, headsets. But for those of us who do require it, it's very difficult for them to hear the questions or the answers if there's too much noise in the House. I ask all members, out of respect to all their colleagues in each of our each in our respective uh, each of your respective caucuses, is to please listen respectfully to the answers and to the questions, so that those of us who require uh, the use of earphones can do so. The Honourable Member from uh, Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Mr. Speaker, the number of people unable to find an affordable place to live in Nanaimo Lady Smith is staggering. And what have the Liberals done? Cut the reaching home funding to Nanaimo by 60 per cent. And the Conservatives plan gut funding and leave it up to rich developers who just so happen to be their biggest donors. Nanaimo needs more support, not less. The Mayor of Nanaimo is calling for federal support. Will the minister provide the funding required for truly affordable housing in Nanaimo? Here, 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 here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to take up the specific matter with the member who just raised it after question period to know more about that specific case in Nanaimo. But what I will say is that this federal government is absolutely committed to ensuring there's greater supply. Supply is always what underpins a housing crisis in this country and every other country that's experiencing exactly that. We need to see more building, and that's why we've incented the private sector by lifting GSD on the building of private, of, excuse me, of uh, apartment rentals. We've moved forward to work with municipalities to see zoning changes where so much of this is dealt with in terms of affordability. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, New Democrats are delivering diabetes medicine and devices and contraceptives for all Canadians, Canadians. today. Free yeah. contraceptives are life-changing for women across this country. But shamefully, Danielle Smith said she doesn't want that for Albertans. Right. My constituents are outraged, and the Conservative leader, when he was asked by the media about this, literally ran away so we didn't have to talk about fairness for women. Will this government ensure that they sign agreements with all provinces so all women, all Canadians have access to the... The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, access to medication for diabetes uh, is not just a question of social justice. It's a question of saving lives. It's a question of prevention. It's a question of uh, reducing costs enormously across this country. And I can say, uh, and specifically with Alberta, that I've had very constructive conversations with Adriana Lagrange, who's been willing to work and find compromise, find that common ground. Unfortunately, across the aisle, that's not what we see. Uh, today, the leader of the official opposition, with the Conservatives, uh, ran away when asked if he would support diabetes medication, refused to answer whether or not he would slash contraceptives for women. They, they are already against dental. I'd really like to know where they stand for pharmacare. The Honourable Member from Pontiac. The Honourable Member for Pontiac. Mr. Speaker, journalists and newsrooms are one of the pillars of our democracy in Canada. And in rural communities uh, like ours, they play a role that's even more fundamental. In December, the Minister of Heritage reached an historic re agreement with Google to provide $100 million of funding to newsrooms. Can she 
give this house an update on how and when newsrooms, but especially local media, will have access to this funding. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And despite, of month, despite months of opposition from the Conservatives last year, we adopted the Online News Act, which allowed us to uh, reach a, an historic agreement with Google. That's $100 million in funding that Google's going to invest in local media that would never have been available uh, had the Conservatives been in power. And uh, yesterday, uh, Google launched its uh, open bid office uh, to ask for eligible newsrooms to apply. Canadians can be sure that on this side of the House, we are always going to stand up uh, to ensure that technological giants uh, pay their fair share to protect Canadian citizens. Thank you. I would just like to ask the member for Paul Neuf Jacques Cartier to respect people taking the floor. The Honourable Member for Regina Capel. Confused because it's not conservatives making a link between these scientists and threats to national security. It's the government's own security agencies themselves saying that these individuals, quote, were collaborating with foreign entities that present a threat to the security of Canada. We're talking about research with pathogens and deadly viruses, while at the same time these individuals were on the payroll of the People's Liberation Army for the communist regime in Beijing. Now, rather than inform Canadians and come clean at the outset, the government went into overdrive to cover it up. How could the Prime Minister be so callous and selfish that he would try to protect himself rather than the security of Canadians? Sorry, the Honourable Minister for Mr. Innovation. Speaker, I'm very happy to answer to my colleague because Canada has shown leadership when it comes to national security, Mr. Speaker. That's something the Conservative will not want to highlight to Canadians. But let me refresh their memory because they tend to be selective when it comes to the facts. On the 16th of January, Mr. Speaker, we announced that we will ban funding for research in sensitive areas. There's 100 entities around the world, Mr. Speaker. We work with our five eyes allies. We work with research centres in this country. We work with university. Mr. Speaker, Canadians know that we will always put national security first and defend the interest of Canada. The Honourable Member from Regina Capel. They want to give themselves a gold star that finally, three years later, after fighting, kicking and screaming to keep these documents hidden, that now they've been released only because Conservatives demanded it. Let's remember the facts. They ignored and refused to comply with four parliamentary orders. They took the unprecedented step of taking the Speaker of the House of Commons to court to keep these documents hidden, and then they called a snap election hoping it would all go away. If this was all just an administrative issue, then why the cover up? The, hon the Honourable Minister of Health. In the first order, uh, one of the things that is disturbing about what the, mem the member is, su is supposing is that if he was in government, uh, and I hope that that doesn't happen, uh, that they would interfere in the redaction process and they would be involved in it. Uh, we obviously did not do that, particularly not with national security. Uh, what we did do, and in fact, he, uh, the member opposite and I had a conversation about this. First, I suggested immediately that they see the documents at NSI COP. He said that wasn't good enough. So I created an ad hoc committee. The ad hoc committee gave them the opportunity not only to see the documents, but put to an independent arbiter whether or not they should be released publicly. We did that together. The documents are released. They're now before us. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Clérable. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is uh, recognized for his admi admiration for, the, uh, for China's basic dictatorship. After eight years, he uh, left uh, he let the Chinese Communist Party interfere in our elections. He turned a blind eye to the interference of, uh, in, with the Chinese di diaspora. And uh, with this Winnipeg lab matter, we see that there are people who represent a credible and serious danger to compromise Canada's national security. Will the Prime Minister finally admit that he tried to cover up these documents to protect himself instead of protecting Canadians? Gonna have been the Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, people listening at home must be saying, well, where were the Conservatives on January 16th? They must wonder, because on January 16th, Mr. Speaker, we announced uh, as a government that we were going to ban funding. May I urge members, please, who have not been recognized, to 
wait uh, their turn, and that way we'll be able to have a proper discussion of uh, shouting across the aisle. The Honourable Minister, please continue. 22 seconds remaining. Mr. Speaker, I hope that the Conservatives will listen this time, because on January 16th, Mr. Speaker, we banned research in sensitive areas uh, to work with 100 different companies. We are, are working with our allies to protect uh, science, to protect intellectual property, and to protect the work that is done by our universities, Mr. Speaker. We are always there to defend Canada's interests. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Éclairable. Where was the minister, Mr. Speaker, in July 2019 when two scientists were expelled from Canada, Mr. Speaker, by, uh, by CSIS? That was in 2019. That was more than four years ago, Mr. Speaker. What we learned yesterday is that the Prime Minister ignored four parliamentary orders to produce papers. He uh, took the Speaker to court, which is, has never been seen before, for the worst cover-up uh, in history. Why did the Prime Minister choose to protect himself instead of Canada's national security? The Honourable Minister of Innovation, Mr. Speaker, people listening at home must be shocked. We have just told Conservatives once again that not only the Prime Minister, but all members of the government on this side of the House, we take national security seriously. On January 16th, uh, we did not ban, ban one research entity, but 100. Uh, so we are protecting universities and colleges from this type of thing. So that's the type of measure we're putting in place to protect Canada's interests. We always stand up for science. The Honourable Member from Ocan. When it comes to health care, Quebecers want care, not threats. A year after, after having forced Quebec to accept an increase in health transfers that covers only one-sixth of their needs, the federal government is now threatening Quebec to, that it will steal $900 million if we don't submit our conditions by March 31st. The Liberals are once again playing political games at the expense of Quebecers with our own money. When will the Liberals finally stop taking ill people hostage and pay Quebec the argument? Argent that or the money that it's entitled to. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I understand that uh, the uh, Bloc Québécois just likes to squabble. But when I spoke uh, with uh, Minister Lebel, it is clear that her objective is to cooperate and to find solutions. In our health care system, I think that Canadians and Quebecers want politicians, members, to find solutions, not to pick uh, fights. And that is why I am very sure that we are going to find an agreement with Quebec. The Honourable Member from Montcan. Mr. Speaker, PharmaCare is not coming anytime soon. Bill C-64 refers to principles to consider when working towards the implementation of national universal pharma, pharma care. Otherwise, in fact, that actually sounds like a collection promise to me. The NDP is sold out very cheaply. But if one day, after having discussed these principles to consider when working towards the implementation of PharmaCare, if uh, Ottawa comes up with a PharmaCare plan that Quebec has already, will Quebec be able to withdraw with full compensation, no strings attached? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, on the contrary, this year, for the first time in the history of the country, Everyone with diabetes, everyone who needs contraceptives will be able to have access to them. That is such an hist uh, historical announcement that it will change the lives of so many Canadians, ev even if Quebec already has such a program. Yesterday, I had a good uh, uh, conversation with Minister Dubé on this topic, and I think that we will reach an agreement with Quebec very soon. Haldeman Norfolk. Mm -hmm. Common sense conservatives will axe the tax, build the homes, 
fix the budget and stop the crime. Right. After eight years, this liberal NDP prime minister is not worth the cost, right. the crime, or the corruption. Right. Never before in the history of this great nation have so many people have to resort to food banks. Thousands are now resorting to d dumpster diving because they can no longer afford the cost of food. Will this prime minister show some compassion and cancel the April 1st carbon tax hike? That's the right thing to do. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. That colleague is from Ontario, where I'm from, Mr. Speaker, and the climate rebate that Ontarians will receive is over $1,100. That's for a family of four. Mr. Speaker, I'm not surprised, though, to hear that member and the Conservatives continue to bring up these points. They want to take money out of the pockets of Canadians. Today, historic legislation tabled in the House of Commons on Pharmacare. The Leader of the Opposition ran away when asked if he would support Pharmacare. When it comes to student loans and helping students, when it comes to EI, pensions in particular, they're nowhere to be seen. They want to make cuts. They're a party of austerity, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Haldeman Norfolk. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are getting back far less from this government than they're paying in That's carbon tax. Right. According to Second Harvest, this year we'll see a 30% rise in the demand for food charity wow. in some regions. Wow. Where I live in southern Ontario, we produce food to feed the entire nation. Yet so many families there still do not have enough income to cover basic food expenses. Why won't this government just do the right thing? Cancel the 23% carbon tax hike on April 1st so that Canadian families can afford food again. Yeah, do the right thing. The Honourable Government House Leader. The woman do member who wants to take Canada out of the UN needs to know a little bit of good news for a change, Mr. Speaker. We've had many months of good news for Canadians. Just recently, Statistics Canada announced that in January we gained 37,000 new jobs. And there are million more Canadians, Mr. Speaker, working before, than before the pandemic. The unemployment rate is at 5.7 percent, and wage growth, wage growth is outpacing infl inflation, and that's even more true for women. You'd think that member would care about such things. Mr. The Honourable Member from Battleford's Lord Minster. Mr. Speaker, common sense Conservatives will axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget and stop the crime. Because after eight years, Canadians know that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost, crime or corruption. Life has never been more expensive in this country. One million Canadians will be relying on food banks this year alone. And still, this Prime Minister is hell-bent on hiking the carbon tax up by 23% on April 1st. Mr. Speaker, why won't the Prime Minister cancel his carbon tax increase and help make life more affordable for Canadians? The Honourable Government House Leader. Speaker, I think the, the Canadians have had enough of the gloom and doom coming from over here. They're deliberately ignoring the truth about how our government has supported Canadians. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, 2.3 million Canadians have been lifted out of poverty since this government took office and started caring about Canadians by putting supports in place that those guys had spent all their time cutting. Families throughout Canada have seen their child keys for care fees slashed, in many cases down to $10 a day, thanks to this government and this bill C-35 that we're getting ready to pass today. The Honourable Member from Vancouver Centre. Mr. Speaker, Black Mental Health Week begins next week. It's a time to amplify black voices and support equity in mental health. 
It is time to correct the disproportionate lack of black health researchers so we can deliver culturally appropriate mental health solutions. It is time to act to improve the wide gap in health outcomes for many black Canadians that is the result of historical and systemic anti-black racism. Can the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions tell us what her department is doing to improve access to cult culturally safe and informed mental health services for black communities across the country? The Honourable Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for, to the member. She is such a tremendous advocate on so many issues that matter to Canadians. Black communities across Canada continue to experience social and economic inequities which have persisted for far too long and have negative impacts on their mental health. We know there's more work to do, Mr. Speaker, and we're committed to do it. together. Through programs like the Mental Health of Black Canadians Fund, we are supporting organizations to develop culturally safe, focused, knowledge-based programs with capacity to improve the mental health of black Canadians and meet their needs. We'll keep working with the black community across Canada, Mr. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Common sense Conservatives will axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget and stop the crime. Meanwhile, after eight years of this NDP Liberal Prime Minister, Canadians know he's not worth the cost, the crime or the corruption. And just yesterday we learned that in the Prime Minister's $60 million arrive scam, one of the contractors who has paid millions is actually a bureaucrat for this NDP Liberal government. That's why Common Sense Conservatives passed a motion in this House demanding that this government produce all of the documents on this Prime Minister scandal. Will he stand in his place and commit to releasing every last page? The Honourable Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker. 24 hours. 24 hours after we became aware that the CEO, CEO of Dalian was a D&D employee, we've taken action, Mr. Speaker. We have suspended all contracts with Dalian. We have suspended the employee, and we have launched an investigation on how this person became an employee of d, &D in the first place. Mr. Speaker, we will act to ensure that we protect the integrity of our institutions and our government. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, let's offer it a little louder for those in the back. What we're looking for is a commitment from this government to release every page of those documents, because after eight years, it's clear to see that these Liberals aren't worth the corruption with their NDP Liberal Prime Minister. It's very clear, a $60 million scandal with people in their basements getting paid $20 million, not doing any IT work, and now we have that Minister's uh, staff who are getting getting paid millions of dollars while Canadians are lined up at food banks. So another question, and I'll say it loud so the minister can hear it, will they commit, stand in their place, to getting Canadians money back for their corruption? The Honourable Minister for National Defence. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'll simply remind the member opposite how quickly we acted. This information became, became to our attention yesterday, and since that time we have suspended all contracts with Delian. We've suspended the member and we've launched a thorough investigation that will determine how this individual became to be employed. M Mr. Speaker, we are demonstrating... Colleagues, um, especially the member from uh, Brantford Grant, who is about to get up to ask a question, uh, just to remind that I expect all colleagues to have respect for each other uh, and to wait their turn to speak uh, when they're recognized by the chair. And at that point, when they have the opportunity to speak, I will also request that all people listen to that member. The Honourable Minister has 15 seconds left on the clock. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I don't want to repeat what I've already said, except to remind the members of this House that when this information came to our attention, we took immediate action. We took the steps necessary to protect Canadians' interests and to remove this individual from our employ. The Honourable Member from Brantford, Grant. Mr. Speaker, common sense Conservatives will axe the tax, we will build the homes, we will fix the budget, we will stop the crime. Well, after eight years, this NDP Liberal Party
Prime Minister, it's not worth the cost, crime or corruption. Yesterday we learned that yet another company received $8 million tax dollars for the Arrive scam. But it gets better. This one, owned by a national defence bureaucrat, the rot continues. Yesterday, Parliament passed our motion to force the government to release all documents and to repay taxpayers. Will the government end the cover-up and release the documents? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister for National Defence. Mr. Speaker, the, the member opposite began his question by talking about all the things that the Conservatives propose to do at some distant point in the future. But, Mr. Speaker, let us remember what they did when they were in government, where they cut the defence spending, for example, to less than 1% of GDP. Less than one. When they cut the resources of the police, our national security intelligence advisors, all of the people whose job it is to protect us and to maintain the integrity of our institutions, they cut them. And, Mr. Speaker, we've been rebuilding the government to get the work done, and we are prepared to take the action necessary. Ask the Honourable Member from South Forest St. Margaret's please to wait his turn to ask a question. The Honourable Member The Honourable Member for Alfred Pellin. Mr. Sebek, in Quebec, we're fortunate enough to have uh, tourist attractions that charm people here in, elsewhere in Canada and abroad. The tourism contribution represents more than 3 percent of employment and 2 percent of the GDP, whether it be for sustainable tourism, agritourism, outdoor experiences, indigenous tourism, or rural tourism. Can the minister tell us how our government is going to maximize the, put the growth potential of this sector? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. And uh, he can tell everyone in his writing and every uh, and all Quebecers that as of today, the tourism growth uh, uh, fund is ready to receive applications from um, all kinds of uh, companies and associations in order to choose projects and uh, make uh, tourists' experience better. Conservatives don't believe in tour tourism. They want to uh, uh, cut everywhere in Saguenay and Gaspésie, but on this side of the House, we stand up for tourism in Canada. Thank you. The Honourable Member from South Okanagan, West Kootenai. Mr. Speaker, last summer's wildfires devastated communities across Canada, and the Minister of Emergency Preparedness has admitted that the upcoming wildfire season will be even worse. Canadians want their government to take decisive action, and according to last week's abacus poll, 74 per cent of them want to see this done through a new national wildfire fighting force. But the Liberals are taking a go-slow approach. The wildfire season is already starting, so when will this government act to create a national wildfire fighting force? That's right. The Honourable Minister. I want to thank the member for the question. In fact, actually, we're taking immediate action, taking the lessons learned from not only last year but previous years as well. First and foremost, we need to make sure that all the resources that we put in place go directly to fighting wildfires, and that's to the local level. So we have already trained approximately 500 firefighters, Mr. Speaker, putting more personnel to support on, on the recovery. Yes, we are reviewing the overall national system as well. well with any support that we provide, we're going to make sure that it actually has the maximum impact. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, we're learning that Palestinians in Gaza have been shot and killed while waiting for aid at a time when the UN reports at least a quarter of those in Gaza are one step from famine. Meanwhile, Amnesty International reports that Israel has failed to comply with the ICJ ruling requiring them to take immediate steps to prevent genocide, including allowing humanitarian aid in. In light of this, when will this government reinstate UNRWA funding, which millions of Palestinians rely on for food, and call on Israel to follow the ICJ ruling? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Gaza are extremely preoccupying. This is catastrophic. I would call this a nightmare scenario. 
So, at all times, international humanitarian law must be respected, and both parties must respect the ICJ ruling. And we need to do more to make sure that humanitarian aid is going into Gaza, and at all times, civilians must be protected. Thank you so much. This brings to an end the question period.